So up next is they're making their way to, uh, to set up the uh, computer and pull up their presentations. We're going to do, do two back-to-back -back sessions. Again, if you look at your agenda, session two and session three. So these are both going to be on the geology, hydrogeology, water budgeting aspect that we've themed this meeting after. So I want to introduce uh, Georgina King from Montgomery and Associates. They were formerly known as uh, um, Hydrometrics. And John Fio, uh, who is with EKI Environmental, and he was uh, formerly of a company, HydroFocus. Everybody in, in the environmental world, everybody merges with everybody else eventually. Um, so both uh, Georgina and John have worked as consultants uh, within this basin to various agencies or this new brand new agency. So they're going to be taking this. We'll do the same drill. They're going to go through things. We'll collect cards. Just keep looking for um, staff walking around sort of making, it's, they're not giving you a hard sign. Okay, they're not doing that. They're, they're giving you a card sign. Okay, so look for staff walking around giving you a card sign and we'll collect them. Um, you're on. Okay. I'm going to stop Georgina King. And I'm um, very happy to be here to talk to you about something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. I'm a hydrogeologist. Um, geology is, my, is what I really like, and um, I think it's pretty cool. My seven-year-old daughter thinks, you know, I'm as, as cool as a, a, an astronaut. You know, geology is a big, a big deal when you're seven. Uh, hopefully it will be for you today. Um, you know, yeah. A lot of people are, are quite fascinated by it, and this is a is an interesting basin. It's 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 not a layer cake, as I'll show you. Um, John is going to start first, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, hydro conceptual models. Good morning. Um, you know, I have to admit that uh, getting in front of a computer that's not mine. I'm one of these people that like gets into a rental car and I freeze. I don't know what, what, what button to push and stuff, so you'll have to bear with me because a lot of times I push the wrong button. Um, but uh, Georgina and he I says are going to be doing the next year. Yeah. We're going to be doing the next two sessions, and um, I'm just going to kind of um, introduce to you the concept of hydrogeological conceptual models, and Georgina's going to go into it in a lot more detail. Um, but it's, you know, it's your first acronym. You know, like Assembly Stone was talking about, Sigma loves acronyms, and your first acronym is HCM. And so a lot of times people say HCM, HCM, Hydrogeological Conceptual Model. And it's something that's required by Sigma. They actually spell it out, and we put the regulation up there, and it says, each plan shall include a descriptive hydrogeological conceptual model of the basin based on technical studies and qualified maps that characterizes the physical components and interaction of the surface water and groundwater systems in the basin. And so there's a little picture up there, and that's basically what it is. You know, what you try to do, reality is out there, and we need to bring it in here and put it into a format that we can understand. You know, and the way I look at it, it's kind of like, a, like an architect. You know, you have an idea for a building. You, you know, you can scratch it out on a napkin in a pub. But eventually you go through the detail and you start designing it and drawing down to the, the individual bolts sometimes. And that's what this is. This is the beginning of trying to pull all the stuff that goes on out there into one place that we can begin to manage it. And manage is kind of a strong term for me. I like to call it stewardship. But we've got to understand the system in order to be good stewards. And so that's what it really is, is putting together the framework for us to understand. So the, and the reason they call it a conceptual model, because it's the part that is in our minds. It's the diagram where things go. Later on, you get into more quantitative means of, of um, you know, evaluating your models. And like John Ricker was talking about, the, you actually have a numerical groundwater flow model that does that, that quantifies things. So what do you do with an HCM? Well, first of all, it provides information like that picture so you can communicate with people more easily. You know, rather than in abstract terms, you can communicate with a diagram and point, point to things. It identifies the water budget components, which we will be talking about. Um, it's the basis for the quantitative model that I described. Um, it helps select you know, potential projects and management actions because you understand how the system works. You can figure out how to manage it. Um, it identifies all those areas that you don't really know very well. You know, there's data gaps, things that need to be improved upon, try to reduce uncertainty. And then it informs you on what things you need to measure in order to monitor the state of the system. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? But you've got to know how, how and where to measure these things. And then finally, um, it's something that's like a living document. It's never done. You're always improving your understanding. It grows with time and you're always progressing 
down you know, a pathway of, of, of better understanding. And so as part of that process, um, Georgina is going to give you some really good information about the structure and the hydrogeology of this basin, you know, how it's built and how it operates. Okay, so um, the first um, slide is a geological map, and uh, it looks pretty with all the different colors, but it's almost impossible to know what it's really telling you, right? Um, and uh, each of the different colors represents a different um, formation. And um, I'm going to, the, the, the next series of slides tries to explain to you kind of in a, a 3D sense what this geological map is telling us. Okay, what's interesting, oh, well, things to point out are the black lines that you see, the Zianti fault on the, on the north side, and there's a Ben Lomond fault, fault kind of on the, on the west side. And Santa Cruz Mint County <coughs> is, um, do, do you see this? Do you see the arrow at all on this? I don't think it, it comes up on the screen. Okay. Um, there's Santa Cruz Mint County to the south. So the basin is, uh, comprises a, a, a a whole series of sandstones, siltstones, shales. You've probably seen these rocks around here in your in your um, neighborhood, in your yards, and they have been deposited into a, a, a geologic trough called the Scotts Valley Syncline. A syncline is just a geologic word for a like a, 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 ba a basin or valley. And the syncline is 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 bound um, by the Ben Lomond Fault and the Zianti Fault, and. Um, this basin is complex. It's not um, the Central Valley is very layer cake, where you just uh, where you just have one layer deposits on another layer, and so on. Here, some of the layers are missing, and um, there's been faulting and things that that uh, mix things up. What you see at the bottom is a, um, a geologic cross section. The section is uh, you know sliced through the earth along that yellow line that you see on the top right and um, it was kind of the southern end of the basin. And John Bricker showed you this, I think, the same cross-section, and I'll be using it a few times. Like he pointed out, the, the vertical black lines are wells where we have geologic data, and that's what we use to develop these cross-sections. And it's also an indication of where people are, are extracting water out of the uh, different formations. So in this one, um, where it says, it points out where there's no Monterey shale. And that has implications of how, how groundwater moves in the basin. So the, the different sedimentary rocks, the, the sandstone shales and siltstones, they are divided into geologic formations and have names that you've probably heard of before, like Santa Margarita Formation, or Pico, and Butano. The base of the basin is a granitic bedrock. It's the paint color that you see there on the on the. Um, and this is another cross section that goes down the western side, um, just uh, to the east of Ben Lomond Fault, and where the yellow line up there on the right, this top right. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in in each of these sections coming up here. So, so. Where's the groundwater in these basins, in these formations that you see? Some of the formations, they have a lot of um, groundwater in them. Some big wells, you can pump a lot of water out of them. Some of them, you know, you can't pump very much water. Some of you might have some of those wells. And it's to do usually with how coarse grain the aquifer material is. The coarser it is, like a sandstone, it can yield a lot of water. Water moves very quickly through it from the surface down into it, into your wells. Um, the finer grained units, like the Monterey um, formation, is mostly shales and a bit of sandstone. A lot of private wells in, in the northern part of the basin, they're, they're tapping that aquifer. And so that's a, a lower yielding well, but it still provides you water. So the, the primary basin aquifers are the Santa Margarita sandstone. You see all of these have sandstone after them. Lompico sandstone, Bhutan sandstone. So this is the cross section again. This is um, these. There are some yellow stars, and those are indicating where the uh, where the sandstones aquifers are. The red one at the top, Santa Margarita, um, and then the kind of orangish tan is is the Lompico formation, and then the very deep one blue 
and uh, is the Butano. And so this, you see that valley where the blue is, and uh, that's the sinkline or that trough where the sediments have been, have been deposited into, or folded into, actually. Then the section that goes north, more north-south, um, you'll see there are a lot of wells in the, in the grey area, which is the Monterey. And that's not really used in, uh, by, the, by the water agencies for water supply, but a lot of the private wells are in there. And uh, a lot of rivers, creeks run through, through this area. So there's interaction, uh, even though it's a low yielding aquifer, it is important. <coughs> So for each of the aquifers, I'm going to go through a series of slides now for each of the main aquifers. I'm going to tell you how water gets into it and how it gets out. And all of this is, is, is vital information when we want to manage a basin. We have to understand this. And, part of, and this is part of the conceptual model and leads also to the to water budget. So a lot of these terms you'll hear in the water budget too. So how does any aquifer really get its recharge? How does it fill up? It's usually from percolation of rainfall down into that aquifer. But there are other sources. It can come through the creeks. Uh, you can get stream bed percolation come down. And also return flow from septics, um, applied landscape water. It's not that efficient. Well, everyone doesn't use it. You know, you try and use as little water as you, as you can. You don't want over water. But if you do, it, it, it can go into the ground. and, and and we try to act over that way. Georgina, I want to say one quick thing, because I know I see a lot of people taking really quick notes. By all means, keep doing that. These present, all the presentations that we're using today will be available at the latest by this coming Tuesday, hopefully by Monday, okay? Just so if you're, if you're studying like you're going to be taking a test on this and this is your last chance, <laughs> we'll have all it available to you. Um, I got to just work with Amy and uh, make sure they all get posted. Just wanted you to know that. Sorry. On the uh, on the uh, Santa Margarita Agency website. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Uh, will what she says be part of the record? The, yes. Yeah, so the video will be uh, the presentations will be part of the video record. That won't actually be able to get posted until around the 27th of February. But the presentations we can get posted by early next week. But the actual pre the, the spoken presentations will be part of the video um, record, and that's all going on the website um, within several weeks of each workshop. Thank you. Okay, so those are the, the, the main, how the aquifer gets its, its, its uh, recharge. And then it, the, the map on the top right there actually shows you where the Santa Margarita occurs at the surface. So those red areas that you see, um, or pinkish areas, that's where, where rainfall falls on them. It, it has a chance to get in, into the deep aquifer into the main part of that Santa Margarita aquifer. And um, you can see it's, it's not, cover, it doesn't cover the whole basin. It's, it's, you know, there's other geologic formations in the areas that's not colored. Uh, the yellow is alluvium, um, and, and so there's often you can get uh, recharged from alluvium down into whatever's below, and it might be Santa Margarita. So um, just consider always um, that surface, you know, uh, outcrop or, covering of, of the aquifer that we're talking about. And you'll see that on each map on the top right there. So the Monterey Shale is actually, there's quite a lot of that, especially in the northern part, like I mentioned. Um, that's the brown color you see on the top right map. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that it's not really a coarse grain sandstone. It's got, it's mostly shale with some sandstone. And um, so it probably has more runoff than it has infiltration into the aquifer to recharge it. So again, it, has, uh, the, it gets its recharge from rainfall and or septics, uh, septic tank leakage or land, landscape irrigation. It also can get, um, you see in the middle of the cross section there, there's the red layer of Santa Margarita. There's some little blue arrows that show movement of water from the Santa Margarita down into the um, Monterey Shale. So it's also getting over, recharged from what's above it. If there was a really uh, per impermeable layer above that, it, it would restrict, and you'll see that coming up the next aquifer. It doesn't get that much because there's an impermeable layer above it. 
And then, and then pumping, pumping, and I, I didn't, didn't mention, mention that on the, the last slide, but, but pumping, pumping is, is, is the greatest outflow to, these, to each of these aquifers. You know, there is outflow to the streams as well. It, they provide water to streams, as John mentioned, base flow, and summer months and throughout the year, really. The Lompico, where uh, most of the, the uh, pumping in the basin occurs, if you added up all the private pumping and all the small water systems and the municipal or the, the agency pumping, and most of it happens in this aquifer. So if you look at the top right there, you'll see very little. You, it's probably hard for you even to see these little ribbons of outcrop of Lompico formation. So it, it has very uh, limited exposure to rain, direct recharge from rainfall. And the, the cross section just shows you on the either side of the section, there's the, the dark blue arrow, um, and those are, are those locations um, next to the faults where, where, the, where it's exposed to rainfall. It's, and in here it's, you see the red, um, the red Santa Margarita formation is actually, in some places there's the Monterey shale between it and the Long Pico, and that restricts that movement down. But where it's in direct contra contact with the little blue arrows are uh, going down, that's where you can get some leakage from the overlying layer to, to recharge it. And again, this, this aquifer, it's, its greatest outflow is from pumping. And then there's adaptive transpiration as well from plants. The Butana aquifer being the very deepest uh, in the southern end of the basin, the Scotts Valley <coughs> District has um, two wells that are 1,500 feet deep. They're the deepest wells in the basin, and you see that with those really, uh, they're, they're accessing almost to the, the ground down there. And um, <coughs> this, this aquifer is also limited out from the, along the Zion fault there. You see the blue in the top right map. And, um, it's, uh, uh, it gets, gets some recharge from overlying Lompico formation, formation, the little the blue arrows you see pointing down, and, and then, then there's, there's pumping out of it as well. Like, like all of them, them that's, that's, that's the biggest outflow component. component. And, and John's going to go into these different water, water budgets. budgets. So all of these, these little arrows become part of the water budget, budget once you quantify them. Okay? Dave? <laughs> Sorry. He's engrossed in your carts. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, let's move on to some Q&A. Right? We're, yeah, right. Yeah, I think so, because there was a, it yeah, yeah, yeah. seemed like a lot of activity. There, there right. was. There was. So I'm gonna, um, some of the questions are questions that I'm, I'm handing over to John or some other members of the leadership, um, because they're broader sort of agency questions, and then some are going to be for the hydrogeology folks. So I'm going to go to them first. Uh, so... Um, Will the three layers of sandstone, including the top layer where the two main quarries exist, support conversion or repurposing for a 2,000 acre reservoir? Do you have any opinion on that or anybody within leadership? Yes. I'm going to take that as a no on your face. Okay. Um, what is the range of depth of the layers in the aquifer? They can't see exactly from the slide, so can you talk a bit about what the actual depths we're seeing are? Okay. There are actual scales on the sides here, um, which are hard to read, right? Um, so they're, they're 200 feet between each of those little tick marks you see on the left-hand side there, just so re for reference. Yeah. So sea level zero is So uh, there, the Santa Margarita is two, two, three hundred feet thick, yeah, and this is just in this cross section. Obviously, in other parts of the basin, it, it's it's bigger. It, it can be thicker or, or thinner. And then the um, the Lompico sandstone, about two hundred to four hundred, maybe six hundred max. 
thickness. And then the butano, the blue deep aquifer, um, is, is pretty thick. That can be about six to 800 feet deep. So yes, there's a lot of water that could be, that could be stored in there. And so those, the aquifers where you saw, John showed you that it's about a 200 foot decline in groundwater levels. Those, those really happened in the Lompico and the, and the Butano aquifers, the deepest ones. The Santa, and those are confined, they're under confined conditions, they behave a little differently. And as, as, you, um, as the plan um, develops as we go forward, uh, you'll learn a lot more about this. This is, uh, and I could talk all day about it and, and it will boggle everyone's minds, but we're, we're trying to do a little bit at a time, so uh, next time we talk a little bit more about it, you'll, you'll, you'll find out m more about how the hydrogeology works. There's no way we could do it all in one day here. Yeah. On average, how long does it take for a drop of water from rainfall to percolate through sandstone to the aquifer? And there's a second question, but on average. Any, any sense of how long it takes for transport? <laughs> you can hand this one to John anytime you want. Yeah, no, you know, there's, it, it takes a long time. It's a, it's a sandstone. It's not uh, unconsolidated sand. So if you think of the beach, you know, that you pour water on top of the sand at the beach, it'll, it goes down really quickly. Um, if you pour water on top of sandstone, uh, it, it takes much longer. And, and there's, you know, in an unconsolidated aquifer, horizontal, so you have to think about horizontal flow and vertical flow. Uh, there's the rule of thumb that it, uh, groundwater moves on average um, about a football field in a year. So just to give you some kind of scale, I think. That's a, an analogy that, that you use. And so here, it would probably be less than that. It would, it would move less than a football field. Uh, so the second question, just to honor the person that wrote it, I think, I think Georgina actually sort of just covered it, was is the aquifer like an underground lake, or is the water embedded in the stone like a sponge? So. I like the sponge better. Yes, it's a sponge. Uh, a hard, you a very hard. You can squeeze it, as you, as you heard. You can't squeeze it and it can't subside because it is a sandstone. It's cemented. It's uh, and it doesn't have the fine grain units that that allow it to compress. Is there any data or evidence on the impact of the Loma Prieta earthquake on the aquifer? And is there any discussion of potential impact from future earthquakes? I have not heard of anything, but John may have. <laughs> I can't, is John still up there? Or is he no, that John. <laughs> oh, that John, okay. Well, then we'll, we'll I'm gonna come to that John in a second, so um, let me keep throwing ones to you guys. Why is Theo getting out of the, okay. <laughs> not very chivalrous of you, John. Um, he knows a lot more's coming his way. <laughs> <laughs> in about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, why do climate change models predict groundwater recharge will decline by 30 percent? I don't look at me like I have the answer. Which, <laughs> which model are we talking about? I, I'm reading the why do climate change models? That, Somebody. That, that's, that's something that John Rick mentioned in his book. Okay. Well, that's a decline in rainfall. Okay. And then while we're at it, how much data has the model taken from Andy Fisher's recharge initiative work? So is your microphone on? I'm just going to come to you. It's on the button, on the bottom. Um, OK, the Andy Fisher's work was done after the model was done. Andy Fisher's a professor at UCSC with the uh, Recharge Institute and worked with the Resource Conservation District to map uh, recharge areas in the county. Um, We've actually had recharge mapping that we did as a part of the county's growth management plan back in the early 80s. So we, we've had a pretty good sense of where the recharge areas are, and the model took that, and, and Andy's work is consistent with that. It's, it's more detailed and, and more precise, but it's consistent with our, our long-term understanding of recharge areas. With regards to the loss of, of recharge uh, that was projected by the U.S. Geological Survey, Recharge is a fairly complex process. It's not like all the rain that hits the ground goes into the basin and, and recharges the aquifer. A certain amount of it run, runs off. A lot of it is just held in the upper soil zones and transpired by all the plants back up into the, uh, the atmosphere. If we get those, 
enough rain to really saturate the soils completely below the root zone that you start to get a recharge. So with climate change, they're projecting, some models say there's going to be more rainfall, some say less rainfall, but they generally agree that the rainfall will be more intense. And what happens then is you have more runoff, you lose more of your rainfall to, to runoff during the storm event, so it's not going into the soil. The other thing that's going to happen when you have more extended dry periods, so the soil moisture will be more depleted and will take more water out of the, the initial infiltration just to, just to keep the soil moisture back up to where it was. So overall, they project uh, less recharge. Again, it's using the models that the U.S. Geologic Survey has developed for watersheds uh, to look at some of those recharge uh, characteristics and model how that works. I'm just going to keep fielding or throwing questions out and either to John or Georgina or John, or John Fio if they want to take them. Do we have a sense of how many wells there are in this basin? We estimate it's probably about 1,400, 1,500 wells. We have uh, records of the county going back to uh, about the early 70s on well drilling. There are a number of wells out there you know, that are older than that. Um, but we, we estimate roughly that that's probably what it is. We probably have records for maybe a half to two thirds to eight percent of the wells, depending on what you, what you look at. Uh, these are two septic related questions. So one is how do septic systems feed aquifers and what impact does septic percolation have on the groundwater quality and level? So the, the septic systems, the effluent goes into the septic tank where it's, uh, where it's treated to a certain level and it flows out into the leaf shield and then percolates down. Um, it, it's a lot like rainfall recharge. If the, if the effluent can percolate down below the root zone, then it's going to continue on down towards the aquifer. It may be intercepted by a clay layer or, say, the moderate shale and go more laterally. So it doesn't reach the deep aquifers, but in places where the septic systems are in the San Margarita sandstone or in the La Pico sandstone, most of that percolation is going to ultimately end up uh, in the aquifer. So that's the good news. The bad news is the, the septic system it is wastewater. Um, the soil generally, if the system is properly designed, decided, and utilized, the soil does a good job of treating that wastewater and removing the contaminants before it, can, it percolates down. Uh, but one of the constituents of sewage is nitrogen, and that nitrogen uh, gets converted to nitrate, which is very mobile and can percolate fairly rapidly down into the aquifer. Um, we spent a number of time uh, studies a number of years ago looking at nitrate issues in the San Margarita aquifer and in the San Lorenzo watershed. We do have somewhat elevated nitrate levels in the river, which we attribute to septic systems in these sandy soils because uh, sandy soils don't remove the nitrate like other types of soils that have more clay in it. Um, the good news is we, we're well below, we're, we're meeting drinking water standards, but the nitrate in the river does contribute potentially to increased algae growth in the river. So we do have a program to reduce uh, nitrogen discharge from septic systems in sandy soil areas. Uh, let me go, I'll do one more to John and, and uh, one hopefully to our, our uh, folks up top. Um, will the decisions made by the agency, and just in general, I'm gonna, uh, we're not going to be focusing a lot on management decisions today, just so you know, so by all means, again, write the questions in, we write them down, we can move them to the next meeting. This is a management decision specifically to offer for such I'm reading it. Will the decisions made by the agency include depletion or restriction of the Little Pico, Butano, Sandstone aquifers, or just the Santa Margarita? Um, it's probably a little bit early to say what the details of the management objectives are. We, we have the general objective of restoring the basin, but we haven't, you know, stated how, how, what that means for each of the different layers. We need to really understand a little bit more what that means. The, the San Margarita is the easiest to manage because it's the closest to the surface, so you can look at things like recharge and that sort of thing. The deep rock river, you can really manage that more by how you manage pumping. So we'll be looking at how we do that and what the, what the costs and benefits of that are. Um, let me go up to John and Georgina. Can you explain the impacts of impermeable surfaces on recharge more than just how it relates to rainfall? I mean, is there, can you talk about what impermeable surfaces, like built impermeable surfaces, do on recharge? I'm here. Um, 
Actually, we, we, have a, we have a nice diagram about that in my talk, but uh, basically, you know, what it does, it's impermeable. So the water runs off. And what becomes important is what happens to that runoff. You know, does it get directed directly into a surface water drainage? Does it go into a, you know, in some parts of, the, of this world, it goes into the sewer. Or does it go into an area that has a high permeability so it can go into the ground? And so that's part of the management actions. You know, you're determined that, okay, we're going to have an area that's impervious, so we're going to direct that water to an area where it can be put to beneficial use. So that's kind of the mindset, but like uh, John was saying, and probably everybody here, you know, we're not there yet. We know there's a lot of good ideas, but we're not there yet to start ticking off the boxes. Is uh, this... I'll, I'll let whoever wants to feel this too. <laughs> Are there any short-term benefits to stream flow by trying to recharge a battery overdrawn aquifer? They may not show in the long-term groundwater storage increase in the face of extended droughts that are brought on by climate change, but there's still short-term benefit to stream flow if there's a really badly impacted aquifer. Any, any feeling about that? Any comfort to respond? If it's a shallow aquifer, because most of the water that's going into the streams is coming from the Santa Margarita, which is the uppermost aquifer. If it's in the uppermost aquifer, and if it's close to the stream, then there is a short-term benefit. If it's not, then it takes a longer period of time. You can inject water down, you know, 1,000 feet, and ultimately it'll benefit the stream flow, but we won't be here when it happens. So it really depends on where it's happening to determine how long it takes to get the benefit. Thanks for that cheery note, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's always important to get a reminder that we're all going to die. <laughs> but have another cookie, okay? <laughs> Is direct potable reuse, John Ricker, I'm gonna give this to you and not the agent of doom over here. Um, Is direct potable reuse getting close enough to being a viable alternative that the GSA consider it as part of the GSP. And again, GSA is Groundwater Sustainability Agency, GSP is Groundwater Sustainability Plan. That's the plan the group has to do. So is direct potable reuse getting close enough to being a viable alternative? I might I note that, that um, I note that Rosemary and Perrette are, and Rick are, I don't know Rick is, they're very conveniently on the very other side of the room where I can't give them the microphone to feel names. Oh, there's Rick. Hey, Rick. Hey, stay right here. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at this one. Um, direct potable reuse is where you treat your wastewater to a very high level and put it directly into the water system. Uh, right now, we are allowed by the state to do indirect potable reuse where we treat the wastewater to a very high level and put it into the aquifer. It moves slowly through the aquifer and then you can pump it out um, and use, put that into the, uh, the drinking water system. So the direct potable reuse is not allowed yet. The state is looking closely at what kind of uh, safeguards and requirements would need to be put in place to allow that. Uh, I think we all suspect at some point that will be allowed, but how long that would take and how, how you know, stringent the protective measures would be and the expense would need to be uh, still remains to be seen. We have a question for Ruth. Have, well, just because you're like, has there been any salt water detected in the San Lorenzo Valley watershed? Not in our wells, but I do know of private wells that have been drilled that has have, that they have found salt water to the point that the water was unusable in the North Boulder Creek area and more in the clays. Um, but our wells, no. Yeah, just, just to add to that, some of the really old geologic formations do have pockets of salt water and it's not connected to the ocean now in terms of seawater intrusion, but it's old, old seawater. All of these uh, formations were laid down in the ocean. They all originally had salt water in them. Most of that salt water has been flushed out over the millenniums of rain coming in, but there are pockets that aren't flushed and there are places in the San Lorenzo Valley uh, where there is salt water. And one of the issues in the old days, they actually put in a number of oil, exploratory oil wells that went down very deep into some of the aquifers and salt water has come up through some of those old oil wells and contaminated the, uh, the upper aquifers. Let me do one. Oh, Can I just add one more thing? Uh, so at the, um, the sea level rise issue is something the city is very um, carefully evaluating relative to 
um, the potential for estuarian impacts to be further upstream because of higher sea levels. Uh, so further upstream in terms of the surface water. So that's one of the things we'll, we're, the city is watching very carefully. <coughs> okay, we're going to need to move on. Uh, again, as always, I'm, I'm keeping the questions that I'm getting folks to feel segregated from the ones not. Um, there are a number of questions that came up in the last session and in um, yeah, actually in the introduction and just now that I'm going to make sure we move on to, to meeting three, which has to do with rainwater capture and gray water and things like that. So by all means, keep if you've got questions like that, keep them in. I'm gonna, I'll see if I can get to them today, but I definitely think that they can become part of the, the third workshop. So we're not, we're not losing.